can tell from the lesson topic, today's message is called oxymoronic. And I think you'll understand what I mean by that as we go through the lesson. The text is taken from an Old Testament book, a prophet, his name was Nehemiah, and it's taken from Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Early the following spring, in the month of Nisan, and that was basically the March-April period of time, during the twelfth year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I, referring to Nehemiah, was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. But I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. An oxymoron, taken from the Greek word opoi, literally means sharp, dull. So it's a figure of speech that combines contradictory terms. Now, since when has a word been defined by a word, I guess that's even in itself somewhat oxymoronic. But an oxymoron is something along the lines of jumbo shrimp, pretty ugly, found missing, definite maybe, only choice, freezer burn, and short prayer. Because is there any such thing as a short prayer? Because when you think about prayer, what generally, I think, comes to mind is the kind of prayer that goes on for hours and hours, says the same thing over and over and over again, throws in maybe a few these and thous just for good measure to impress the crowd. Sometimes, however, we make way too much of prayer by making it far too complicated. Here's what I mean. Simply stated, God is our Father. We're His children. And we can talk to our Papa, our Abba, anytime about anything we want. Sometimes we talk to God for a long time. Sometimes we just give out a little shout like, hey God, Sometimes you might pour out your heart to God through tears. And other times you just say, thank you. There are all sorts of prayers. There are long prayers, most definitely. There are short prayers as well. And there are prayers that are in between in terms of the time that we spent engaged in prayer. Now, our man, Nehemiah, prays throughout the book of Nehemiah repeatedly And quite honestly, it's one of the great threads that tends to weave this whole book together. And in this particular passage, Nehemiah offers up a quick little prayer because, well, you know, certain decisions in life, even certain opportunities in life, are strategic. You know, if you miss this opportunity, it might be gone forever. And so you pray. For instance, are you going to a job interview? Well, then you would probably pray about that. If you're taking a test, you would probably most definitely be praying about that. If she's cute and you're scared and you want to go out on a date with her, then you're probably praying a lot about that particular moment. So here, 
Nehemiah sends up a prayer. And I think it was something along the lines, because we don't know, he doesn't say what he prayed, it just said that he did. But I'm kind of thinking, given the context within which we just now read from Nehemiah chapter 2, Nehemiah said something along these lines. God, give me the right spirit, give me the right words, give him the right attitude, and please don't let him kill me. Amen. So it was a quick little prayer. And I think perhaps a little background about Nehemiah would be helpful to understand the context of what we're talking about today. The first chapter of the book that bears Nehemiah's name provides some pretty important details. The year is 446 B.C. And Nehemiah is living in one of the Persian capitals at the time, Shushan. Artaxerxes is the king of the Persian Empire, and Nehemiah is on the state payroll. He's a cupbearer. Now, the cupbearer was an officer of very high rank in the Egyptian, the Persian, and the Assyrian empires. Because you see, in those days, one of the best ways to take out a monarch would be to poison him. So, to prevent that kind of catastrophe from happening, the cupbearer would taste the wine before the king drank of it. <laughs> that way, if the wine had been poisoned, the cupbearer would die instead of the king. So clearly, it was a very risky, risky job. But it was an admirable one, too, because of the constant fear of plots to take out monarchs during this period of time, a person like Nehemiah had to be regarded as thoroughly trustworthy to be in that position. And because of the job's close relationship to the king, it was often a position of great influence as well, because he was always there to the extent that the king wanted to have wine. So Nehemiah's life, was absolutely centered on serving and pleasing King Artaxerxes. But Nehemiah is a Jewish man who is in exile. He's far, far away from Jerusalem, some 800 miles away. And as a Jewish man living in exile, Nehemiah's thoughts are about home. We know this because at the very beginning of the book, we see Nehemiah asking about the condition or the state of Jerusalem, including the condition of those who had remained, like family and friends. And the report that Nehemiah received was pretty grim. The survivors who survived the onslaught were seriously depressed, and the wall around Jerusalem was nothing but charred rubble. And I think, perhaps in Nehemiah's mind, the most precious monuments of Nehemiah's memories of his homeland had been completely and utterly destroyed, and many of his friends and perhaps family had been murdered. And making matters worse, Nehemiah is 800 miles away when he gets the bad news. The result? We know from reading the book of Nehemiah that he wept and he mourned and he fasted and he prayed because he understood that there is an intersection between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. You see, God doesn't need us to carry out his will. Really, God doesn't. It's not as if God is somehow handcuffed by our lack of participation. And yet, although God doesn't need our participation, he most certainly honors it. In fact, the Bible reveals a God who loves to respond to his creation when they are engaged in action. And this is important to remember, I think, since we're prone to moving between two completely opposite extremes. On the one hand is the extreme that believes God is sovereign and doesn't need our help. 
But this extreme generally leads to the wrong conclusion that since God is sovereign, we shouldn't bother God with our petty little requests. Stated differently, perhaps, God will do whatever he wants to do, regardless of whether or not he's asked. Now, if this had been Nehemiah's theology at the time, he probably would have said in response to the news now that he's received from Jerusalem, something along the lines of, well, God bless you. That stinks. But hey, don't worry. God will fix this before too long, so let's just get back to business as usual here in Shushan. There's no need to lose any sleep over it. God will act when he's good and ready. Now, it's perfectly appropriate to believe that God is sovereign because he is. But we blow it, I think, if we allow that kind of thinking to lead to a sense that our involvement is inconsequential. That kind of theology is called fatalism or determinism. And in my opinion, it is not good theology. So that's the one extreme. On the other extreme is that prayer in and of itself changes things. With that kind of mindset, we can get to the point of thinking that everything Literally everything hinges on our prayer. If this had been Nehemiah's theology, he probably would have said something like, oh, this is all our fault. If we'd only prayed harder, Jerusalem wouldn't be all messed up. But it's not too late. We can fix this if we just pray hard enough then God will do what we ask. This kind of thinking leads to the conclusion that God is no longer sovereign, that we are, and that somehow our prayers kind of coax God into doing something that he didn't want to do in the first place. But now that we've gone and pestered him to death, like the widow in the New Testament, Well, he's got to act. Now, I truly believe in persistency. The New Testament widow is an example of that. She pestered that judge to death until she finally received justice. So I believe in persistency. But this kind of thinking carries matters to an extreme. Nehemiah, on the other hand, regarded God as both utterly sovereign, but also utterly willing to respond to human action. And we don't need to read too many verses before we see that God responds to Nehemiah's prayer. I would challenge you to go home today and read the book of Nehemiah. Just the first five chapters of the book. And I want you to find out that after this prayer of Nehemiah, God does answer it. But you know, he doesn't answer it until three months later. And I think that that's kind of an important detail for all of us who expect that God is going to instantly move mountains when we pray. Even if we cite scripture assuring us that God will answer our prayers, you know as well as I know that the Bible is replete with examples that God will in fact answer our prayers, but at a time and in a manner of his choosing. Prayer is not some sort of magical incantation that produces some instantaneous result from the sovereign. So approximately three months after hearing the news of Jerusalem's desperate, desperate circumstances, Nehemiah now has an encounter with the king. In fact, From reading, we understand that the king is quite concerned because Nehemiah apparently had some sort of hangdog expression on his face and the king was asking him if he were sick. So Nehemiah shows up for the job that day and he's out of character. He's down in the mouth. Something is really plaguing his mind. And so being sympathetic to Nehemiah's situation, the king says, 
hey, how can I help you? He's a trustworthy person. He's been in this capacity for years. The king trusts him, likes him, wants to help him, sees this hangdog expression on Nehemiah's face and says, okay, well, what can I do to help? And what follows the king's question, I think, is striking. Maybe even profound. Because rather than immediately answering the king, what does Nehemiah do? He prays. So here's the picture. Nehemiah is standing in front of the monarch of the strongest nation on the planet, and seated next to him is his wife, no less. Compounding matters is the fact that Nehemiah is absolutely terrified. He's just standing there with his cup in hand. His eyes are big as saucers. His knees are probably knocking. His hands might be shaking. His palms are sweating. His heart is racing. His head is throbbing. And what does he do? He prays. I'm thinking it couldn't have been a very long prayer at all. In fact, the king probably didn't even see Nehemiah's lips move or even notice the slight hesitation in Nehemiah's response. It was long enough for Nehemiah to call upon the God of the universe for help. Now, I can remember a time when I was in the elementary school when comments would frequently show up on my report card. I don't know if your parents came to you with you know, the back to school night and all that kind of stuff, and the report cards would typically come home, and there were comments. I was an overall good student, but the comment that most frequently showed up on my report card is Randy needs to think before he speaks. I know, it still plagues me, as you can tell. But Nehemiah does one better. Nehemiah prays before he speaks. How many of us can say that? Too often we think of prayer as some sort of scheduled time on the calendar to talk with God. But that's not the model of prayer demonstrated by Nehemiah. Nehemiah shows us that God was often on his mind, that no time was the wrong time to pray, no time was too short a time to pray. In other words, he didn't need a long prayer to get God's attention. However, Nehemiah did more than just pray. Nehemiah was ready to act. Nehemiah had asked the king for a leave of absence in order to go back to Jerusalem and personally oversee the rebuilding of the walls surrounding that city. In fact, Nehemiah even had the nerve, as you'll read through this book, even had the nerve to ask the king for letters written by the king, sealed by the king, so that Nehemiah could show them to the various governors with whom he'd come in contact along this 800-mile journey. What's a Jewish exile like you doing in a place like this? Here's a letter from the king. Bah. These letters would also secure the supplies which were necessary Because the king sent Nehemiah with money, basically his credit card. Whatever you need, charge it to my account. So not only did he have letters of authority, he had letters of credit so that he could do what he planned on doing. And what Nehemiah had in mind was this complete makeover of Jerusalem. And the king's response to this, the king granted them to me because the good hand of of my God was on me. Have you ever felt the hand of God on you? Do you see here the intersection between human responsibility and God's sovereignty? Nehemiah prayed because he knew that the remedy to his problem was completely beyond his control. Nehemiah prayed because he understood that his success 
dependent upon God's hand being on him. But Nehemiah also understood that he was not inconsequential to the process. He didn't just pray. He readied himself to personally participate in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Okay, well, so how does that apply to me? I mean, what, what does all this mean? Well, I think it means actually one of two things. First, we need to pray. We must pray. Whatever our predicament, whatever our circumstances, we need God's hand to be on us if we are to succeed. But secondly, we've got to do more than just pray. We've got to be willing to roll up our sleeves. We've got to be willing to participate in what we're praying for. For instance, are you praying for the church here? I hope you are, and that is terrific. But are you capable of doing more than just praying for the church? And if not personally getting involved in some of its ministries, are you able to write letters of encouragement to those who do? How about praying for the growth and attendance here at Oak Hill? Are you doing that? Again, that would be great. But when was the last time you invited a friend? I mean, the church doesn't grow without invitations sent to others to join us. It's said that shepherds, like elders, like Curtis and Kirk and I, shepherds don't make sheep. Sheep make sheep. And so in, if you're praying for the growth of Oak Hill, well, invite someone here. Bring them along with you. If this is a place where you're achieving some spiritual growth and fellowship and worship, then invite someone to come. We've got to commit ourselves, I think, to a higher standard than just prayer alone. But that doesn't necessarily mean, church, some lengthy long, flowery, King Jamesy kind of prayer rant. And that's not what I'm talking about. Shorties will do. I mean, look at Nehemiah. His prayer lasted maybe, I don't know, 1.9 seconds. But it was effective. Not only because it was said, but because Nehemiah was ready to do more than just pray. True worship always results in service. A.W. Tozer, a very proficient, very good Christian author, was once approached by a preacher who complained that he needed more workers to maintain the various ministries that were going on at his church. And Tozer disagreed. No, you don't need more workers. Oh, yeah, I do. I need more workers. I need to have more people here. And Tozer said, no, you don't. What you need are more worshipers because wherever there's worshipers, there's workers. I've never met a true worshiper who was unwilling to work. Quote, end quote. So maybe a short prayer isn't oxymoronic after all. Fact is, we might very well have the shortest prayer on record in the Bible, and look what happened. But then again, maybe answered prayer is an oxymoron of sorts, since wishing has never, ever been a substitute for prayer. I want you to notice that it's usually left to me, not always, but more often than not, I pick the songs and deliver the message for the most part. And so I try and, best I can, tie all these things together. And I want you to notice something. Go to your bulletin. Look at the order of worship and consider the songs that we sang today. I will pray. 
Father, in the morning, unto thee I pray. The next song we sang, abide with me. God, please abide with me. The next song we sang, be with me, Lord. A prayer that God be with us. The next song we sang, dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive my foolish ways. And the song that we're going to sing in just a minute, I need thee every hour. You've been praying all morning, church. Did you know that? Every song you sang today was a prayer. We had prayers for the Lord's Supper. We had an opening prayer. We'll have a closing prayer. This church is a prayerful church. And you've been praying all morning, and maybe you didn't even know it. Church, it's not hard. It can be short. It can be long. It can be somewhere in between but it is absolutely vital that we pray. But like Nehemiah, we need to be prepared to act on what we are praying for as opposed to just praying in a vacuum and wishing world peace on everybody and then go about our day as if nothing really matters about that particular request. So short prayers are good ones, church. Even quickies like Nehemiah. I mean, I'll go back to the text because maybe you missed it. It's easy to miss The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to God of heaven, I replied, how long could that have taken? I suggested 1.9 seconds. Didn't even see Nehemiah's lips move. It was a quick prayer. He finally had an opportunity with the audience of a king, with somebody who could do something about the problem and was now given the opportunity to make a request. Oh, God, please help me. Let me use the right words. This is what I need, king. It didn't take long. And look what God did. He acted. Did he act right away? No, it took three months. But when God acted, he did. He sent Nehemiah 800 miles back to a place previously of exile with a credit card and letters of authority. And if you continue reading in the book of Nehemiah, you'll find out that it wasn't an easy job. Just because the king gave him permission to go and a credit card to charge all the product didn't make it easy. There was infighting among the Jews fighting as to how we're going to build the wall. In fact, we had some workers on the wall who were building with one hand and holding onto their sword with the other because they're being attacked. It wasn't an easy job, and Nehemiah knew it. And he knew that the only person who could answer his question and deliver on promises that Nehemiah wanted to make was praying to God, and he did. And Nehemiah was also willing to act on his request to God. And let that be an encouragement for us to do the same. So we're going to sing, I Need Thee Every Hour. If you have any prayer requests, you can hand them up at this time. We'll pray about them, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's stand and sing, please.